Welcome to the Old Bridgewater Historical Society. Uh, my name is Shelley Karolchik. I'm the president of the organization, and I'm so thrilled to see so many people here today and so many new faces. Um, while we're giving them any lovely bit of stragglers a few minutes to, to come on in, um, I'll let you know that the building that you are sitting in was built specifically for the Historical Society in 1900. We get asked all the time, people assume it was a town building at one time, and no, it was built specifically for us, and it was built as a brick building because they knew it would house a repository and they wanted it as fireproof as possible. Um, the organization was founded in 1894. Um, we are dedicated to the history of the four Bridgewaters, East Bridgewater, West Bridgewater, um, um, Bridgewater itself, and who knows the fourth? Brockton, thank you, which used to be North Bridgewater. The area we're standing in originally was Bridgewater, as was an area 14 square miles um, from north to south, east to west. Um, it was a very large purchase um, made in 1649 by the Pilgrims Constant, Sa Constant Southward Samuel Nash and Miles Standish. Um, it's, it's been um, a long time, for those of you who don't know, we, we also run the Cape House, which is around the corner that was built in 1663 as a job perk to attract minister to the fledgling town. And throughout the spring, summer, and fall, we opened it up on Sunday afternoons for free tours. We run it as a colonial home museum. It's uh, West Bridgewater's little known secret, but we do try to open it up. And we, for those who can't make it on Sunday afternoons, we do open it by appointment. We are a membership-driven organization. However, we open our events to the public. Um, the perks of membership include getting our quarterly newsletters, which are always packed with historical articles relating to the Four Bridgewaters or the founding families. Um, for those of you who are new and have never been in here, please look at some of our newsletters before you leave. Feel free to take a copy with you, as well as some of our brochures that were out. If you're new and haven't already done so, please sign our guest book when you come in. Um, we did today, we are giving away a raffle prize. The raffle will be drawn after the event. You didn't need to purchase a raffle ticket. If you made a donation at the door, you've already received one. If you didn't, please let our wonderful volunteer, Jean, know and she'll get you set up. And it's not too late to make a donation if you haven't already. Our prize today is a book of quotations about from Abraham Lincoln, a copy of the Blu-ray The Conspirator, which our speaker um, has consulted on, as well as um, two Abraham Lincoln golden dollars. So, um, upcoming events. We have um, an event coming up in April that is about the Gravestone Carver Letty, forgive me, it's a whole one day, um, Barney Leonard, who came from Bridgewater and he was a well known uh, carver of, of gravestones and carved many in the Taunton Basin area, as well as throughout Plymouth County. We have um, an event coming up as well where we're gonna be crafting, um, for those of you who like to get all messy with the glitter and the resin, we're gonna be doing um, window catchers, sun catchers, in, um, that's April as well, is that correct? May 19th. May 19th, I stand corrected. Um, we also have another event coming up in the not so far future, um, that will deal with land speculators, colonists, and the Native American tribes in New England. We have another one that's gonna come up um, about bad deeds and the bad land deeds that were made between colonists and Native Americans. Um, the other one we have coming up in October will be about DNA, and, and, and for those of you that are genealogists, how to interpret your DNA results and what you, what you can do with them now that you have them. <clears throat> Always keep an eye on our Facebook page. We do list in history list. It is always, our community events are always listed on both our website and in our newsletters for members. Um, and we do send out emails to our membership to let them know about coming events. The majority of our events are free. The majority of them are open to the public. So um, without further ado, what I'm gonna do is introduce to you um, Dr. Thomas Turner. Um, who has come today to speak to us about the Lincoln assassination. He is a professor emeritus at Bridgewater State University where he has taught history for 39 years. Um, he has consulted, as I mentioned, 
on the conspirator movie with directed by Robert Redford. The movie was about Abraham Lincoln. He's also written a chapter of the book he's brought with us today, and he'll talk to you about that. And he's also, and I have to bring my paper for this one, vice chair of the Massachusetts Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission. That's a mouthful. So without further ado, I hope that you will fully enjoy his visit with us today. And if you have any questions afterwards, I'm sure he'll feel free to answer them. As well as there are quite a few board members present, and we will be around for quite a while after the meeting. If you have any questions about the organization, anything you see in the building, joining, or anything else, please track one of us down, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Without further ado, Dr. Turner. Thank you, Sherry. It's my pleasure to be here with you. I, uh, I have to admit, uh, on a Sunday at 1 o'clock, I wasn't sure that we might you know, have six or eight people. Uh, so <laughs> thank you all for coming. And uh, as I say that, I do have to tell you a quick story about Abraham Lincoln. He used to go around lecturing as well. And uh, he lectured on inventions and technology. And one time, uh, when he was going to give a lecture, and they were charging 25 cents uh, for admission, uh, he only got a crowd of 10 or 12 people. Uh, Lincoln refused to speak, and they refunded the money. So uh, I, I wasn't going to do that if we had to you, you, you be a free anyway. But even if I had six or eight, I was going to go on. Uh, it's a good time to uh, talk about Abraham Lincoln, of course. Uh, Tuesday was the uh, 210th uh, anniversary of uh, Lincoln's birth. I think somehow that probably goes by rather unnoticed here uh, in more... Uh, modern times, of course, you can still uh, uh, honor Lincoln uh, tomorrow with President's Day, which I don't like. There are some presidents uh, I would honor. There are some I won't. I won't tell you who the ones I won't. But uh, in any case, uh, we're here to talk a little bit about uh, the Lincoln assassination, and uh, uh, the title of it is What Goes Around Comes Around, Americans Interpret the Lincoln Assassination. What goes around comes around is a saying that's familiar to most Americans. Some people might conclude that it is an appropriate way to summarize the status of research into the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. A close examination reveals that there is a circular wheel-like motion in the manner in which Link Americans have interpreted the death of the 16th president. When John Wilkes Booth shot the president at Ford's Theater in April 1865, it was hardly a great leap of imagination for Northerners to conclude that the Confederates were the sinister force behind the murder. After all, the assassin, who was a well-known Southern actor, had shouted, Six Semper Tyrannus, the motto of the state of Virginia, but had he said nothing, suspicion would still have fallen upon the South. Navy Secretary Gideon Wells, on learning of the shooting, reacted with uncharacteristic profanity, damn the rebels, this is their work. And Mrs. Wells was a bit shocked that he used the word damn. Uh, so, uh, at the conclusion of the Civil War, which historians now estimate cost 750,000 deaths, and uh, we used to think it was 620, but that's been revised over the, uh, fairly recent years, there was nothing more natural than for the public to believe that the president's assassination was the last desperate act of the Confederacy. Since Lincoln was shot on Good Friday, April 14th, 1865, and died the next morning, many mourners compared the martyred president to Moses, who did not reach the promised land, or even Jesus. Tens of thousands of mourners attended memorial services on Easter Sunday, hoping that their clergymen might explain and help them comprehend this national tragedy. Many sermons reinforced the idea of Southern involvement, in a typical sermon, Reverend W.H. Bernard told his congregation, and thus did the rebellion prove itself by its own last act to have been a, all a murder, clothed in the dark and filthy rags of a lie, the very child and image of him who was a murderer and lying liar from the beginning. And there are still hundreds of those sermons uh, that still exist in uh, libraries, and the uh, vast majority are, are along those lines, really. Since it was a simultaneous assault on Secretary of State William Seward, which left his home a bloody shambles, and Seward himself badly injured, as well as rumors of a man lurking about uh, Vice President Johnson's hotel, authorities had no way of knowing how widespread the plot was. 
one can imagine if a similar bloody scene unfolded today, the public would hardly see it as the work of a few lone individuals, but rather as a terror attack by Al-Qaeda or ISIS or some other radical group. Many people also exhibited a strong desire to impose vengeance upon anyone who sympathized with Booth's deed. Outside Ford's theater on April 14th, there were calls to burn the building, while one man who said, I'm glad it happened, had most of his clothes torn from his body and was only rescued by three police officers with guns drawn as he was being hustled to a nearby lamppost. Probably no more dramatic event occurred than that recorded by Melville Stone, the general manager of the Associated Press. Quote, I made my way around the corner to the Madison House. Very soon I heard the crack of a revolver and a man fell in the center of the room. His assailant stood perfectly composed with a smoking revolver in his hand and justified his action by saying, he said it served Lincoln right. There was no arrest. No one would have dared arrest the man. He walked out a hero. I never knew who he was. And you can picture that. You know, here's a guy who commits cold-blooded murder, but uh, because allegedly the guy said, hey, uh, Lincoln got what he deserved, you know, he gets a nice round of applause and off he goes, you know, no punishment. Historians have unearthed over 200 violent acts, including one individual who was thrown to his death in the paddle wheel of the Brooklyn Ferry for a similar uh, alleged utterance. However, over the course of the next 150 years, suspicion shifted to other suspects, the first being Andrew Johnson during the radical Republicans' attempt to impeach the president and remove him from office, and then in the 20th century to the radical Republicans themselves. Finally, the wheel made a complete circle when William Tidwell, David Gaddy, and James Hall argued in Come Retribution, the Confederate Secret Service, and the death of Lincoln, that the Confederates actually had been behind the plot to kidnap Lincoln and then to kill him, although they were not directly involved in Booth's assassination plot. A brief survey of the manner in which historians have treated the assassination brings this circular motion into sharper focus. After a massive manhunt, Booth was tracked down and killed in Garrett's barn on April 26, 1865, and eight alleged co-conspirators were arrested and tried before a military commission. The guilt of several of the accused seemed a foregone conclusion. Lewis Powell had attacked Secretary of State William Seward and members of his household, David Herold had been found with Booth and Garrett's band, and George Atzerod admitted that the assassin had assigned him to kill Vice President Johnson, but he had lost his nerve. Powell's lawyer even argued that it was his client's southern background that had caused him to become involved in the plot, a sort of environmental insanity. And you can imagine how that went over uh, in court, right? That's not going to get you too far. Uh, and uh, so very uh, uh, bad impressions here of uh, these individuals. Three other plotters, Michael O'Laughlin, Samuel Arnold, and Edmund Spangler, were perceived by the military tribunal to be less clearly involved in the murder, although deeply connected with Booth's attempt to capture the president and exchange him for Confederate prisoners. And that was Booth's uh, original intention. Uh, the, the exchange of prisoners stopped, and. Uh, so uh, it was uh, uh, decided by Booth, hey, if I could kidnap Lincoln, uh, maybe we could exchange him for, for those prisoners. Uh, therefore, O'Laughlin and Arnold were sentenced to life in prison, while Spangler received a six-year sentence as an accessory, his major offense being that he had been asked to hold Booth's horse. Whatever the trial revealed about the guilt or innocence of the specific conspirators, it reinforced the idea just like Booth, they were supporters of secession and tools of the Confederacy. Arnold, O'Laughlin, and Powell all served in the Confederate Army, although Arnold was discharged after First Bull Run due to illness, and O'Laughlin left the service in June of 1862. Powell fought at Gettysburg and was captured before breaking his parole and residing in Baltimore for a time. George Atzerodt was a blockade runner who had ferried agents and supplies across the Potomac River. Very few people had any doubts why these individuals would be involved in efforts to either kidnap or kill Abraham Lincoln. The case of two other accused, Mary Surratt and Samuel Mudd, have always been more controversial. Defenders of Mrs. Surratt 
have portrayed her as the innocent victim of plots in which her son was involved, while supporters of Dr. Mudd see him as having been arrested for setting Booth's leg, as any doctor might have done. Recent scholarship, including George Atzerodt's lost confession that surfaced in the papers of his attorney, and Edward Steer's study of the Mudd case, His Name is Still Mudd, the case against Dr. Samuel Alexander Mudd. I, I, I love historical works that have clever titles. That's one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, I used to, Ed used to work with me on the Lincoln Herald, but I, I know Ed well, uh, have provided evidence that Samuel Mudd was involved in the plan to capture Lincoln, uh, although his involvement in the murder is less clear. Kate Lassen entitled her recent study of Mrs. Surratt, The Assassin's Accomplice, and argues that Mary Surratt was intimately involved with Booth's plotting and perhaps even deserved the death penalty for her actions. Like the other conspirators, there were no doubts about Surratt and Mudd's Southern loyalty. Both families were slave owners. In fact, the Mudds were one of the largest slave-owning families in Maryland. Dr. Mudd certainly looked on emancipation as destroying his family's livelihood, although the Emancipation Proclamation did not immediately apply to, apply to Maryland, which remained in the Union. Mudd was also apparently involved in the Confederate underground activities and lied to the authorities about the number of times he had met with Booth in Maryland. Booth had been down to his home uh, on several occasions. Booth uh, and Mudd tried to cover up uh, one or two of those uh, visits. Mary Surratt's son John was a Confederate courier and blockade runner, and her son Isaac served in the Confederate Army in Texas. R.A. Watts, in a 1922 article, skillfully captured the dilemma faced by the defendants. Quote, What a boon to Arnold, Spangler, and Mudd would a fair reputation for loyalty have been. While the public paid attention to the cases of the individual conspirators, many people were equally fascinated by testimony concerning alleged Confederate involvement in the assassination. A considerable number of witnesses testified about Southern atrocities, such as mistreatment of prisoners, poisoning of water supplies, and spreading of yellow fever to northern cities. And in fact, as you can imagine, uh, some controversy, uh, th there's more of that kind of testimony if you look at the trial record uh, than there actually is uh, specifics against the conspirators. And of course, it was a military trial. Uh, it's one of the reasons uh, that they did have a military trial. You could get in that type of evidence. And, and so, you, uh, again, a military trial, uh, that type of evidence was, uh, was admissible. Uh, the court functioned almost like a Warren Commission that was determined to unravel the workings of a larger conspiracy. As the Boston Evening Transcript said on June 23rd, it is now abundantly proved that a court can find within strictly legal bounds and never traveling out of the narrow limits of merely technical investigation could not have developed the full extent of this hideous plot. To some contemporaries as well as historians, the unfairness of the military court was reinforced in 1867 when John Surratt was captured in Alexandria, Egypt, and returned to the United States for trial. Since he was tried in a civil court on the same evidence on which his mother was convicted and the jury could not agree about his guilt, it was easy to portray the 1865 trial as a horrible miscarriage of justice. In reality, the military commission was not as harsh as often portrayed. It only imposed the death penalty on four defendants, and there is no guarantee that a civil jury aroused by Lincoln's death would have been any more lenient. And again, you can imagine people who are throwing people into a paddle wheel to their death. You know, if they get on a jury, uh, they're, they're not going to be listening for evidence. They know who's guilty, right? So uh, I'm not so sure if, uh, that a civil jury would have had a much different outcome. In reality, there were more subtle forces at work in 1867 including the fact that public indignation had cooled somewhat over the course of the past two years. In this atmosphere, the case against John Surratt proved to be less than overwhelming. While newspaper editorials expressed belief in Surratt's guilt after the prosecution evidence was presented, once the defense testimony started, the case began to fall apart. Severe doubt was cast as to whether Surratt was even in Washington on April 14th, uh, and he apparently wasn't. He, he was in upstate New York. He was on a mission for the Confederate government, but it had nothing to do 
uh, with the assassination. And years later, one of the prosecutors, Edward Carrington, admitted that Booth's guilt, had, uh, uh, that uh, Surratt's guilt, rather, had not been proven. When the jury could not reach a verdict, the public seemed more than willing to leave the task of unraveling the case to historians. And by the way, John Surratt uh, tried to lecture a bit uh, on the assassination. That didn't go over too well. Uh, but uh, he did go to work for a, a steamship company. He lived into the 20th century. I think he died in 1914 and uh, pretty, pretty much left alone and unmolested uh, uh, after the trial. Uh, they didn't try him again. As early as 1867, another subtle shift can be observed. The radical Republicans, as they attempted to gather evidence to impeach Andrew Johnson and remove him from office, began to hint that Lincoln's successor might have been involved in the murder. The enigmatic card that Booth left in the vice president's box, which read, don't wish to disturb you, are you at home, was now seen as proof of Johnson's complicity. The radicals even formed a congressional committee with Benjamin Butler as its chair to gather evidence, and some testimony was taken from the convicted conspirators who were incarcerated at Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortugas. And uh, you can imagine there were offers made, if you can uh, you know, tell us that, uh, in fact, uh, Johnson's involved in the plot, you know, maybe uh, your sentences could be uh, you know, lessened or commuted or whatever. But he obviously wasn't, and, and to their credit, they, they didn't try to say that he was. While nothing came of this investigation, it is not unusual in a sensational assassination case for suspicion to center on the vice president, who in a certain sense stands the most to gain from the death of his predecessor. After all, there have been similar allegations that Lyndon Johnson was involved in the death of John Kennedy. An examination of the website Amazon.com reveals a book by one Roger Stone titled The Man Who Killed Kennedy, The Case Against LBJ, uh, which was released back in 2013. It was apparently des uh, designed to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. Of the 391 people who purchased and rated the book on Amazon, 244 gave it five stars, uh, apparently convinced uh, firmly that Lyndon Johnson played a leading role uh, in his predecessor's death. I, at least the conclusion I would draw from that, uh, you know, the, they, they must have liked the, the, the thesis of the book, I would think. The next major turn of the wheel simply mirrored the manner in which historians were writing about Reconstruction. Once Reconstruction formally ended in the aftermath of the disputed presidential election of 1876 between Rutherford Hayes and Samuel Tilden, the radical Republicans and their views quickly fell into disfavor. Historians such as William Dunning, a prominent professor at Columbia University, fostered the idea that radical Reconstruction was an unmitigated disaster that allowed a reign of terror to be unleashed against the prostrated South. Dunning had a huge impact both through his writings as well as through the work of his graduate students who went on to teach a number of places and uh, carry on that thesis. It was in this climate that David DeWitt published his two very influential books, The Judicial Murder of Mary Surratt and The Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. DeWitt, a lawyer and Democratic politician, painted an unflattering portrait of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and the radical Republicans. According to DeWitt, Stanton used the assassination to launch a vindictive reign of terror against the South. One innocent victim of the bloodthirsty war secretary was Miri Surratt, and she had been condemned to death, in his view, uh, on rather flimsy evidence. In the 1930s and 1940s, Chicago chemist and historian Otto Eisenschimmel carried the case one step further when he hinted that not only were the radicals evil and vindictive, but that they hated Lincoln so much that they were behind his murder. Eisen Schimmel used the clever technique of raising a series of provocative questions that allowed him to retreat when his critics pushed him too hard. And uh, I always say it reminds me uh, of a question like this, to which I think you will agree there's no a good yes or no answer. Have you stopped taking drugs? <laughs> if you say yes, uh, you were taking them uh, uh, here, you know. Uh, and uh, so y yes or no, I'm not really, really going to get you much there. And if somebody hears that question, they're going to think, ah, somebody asked me about drugs. He's on drugs, right? Uh, 
the type of thing Eisenschimmel would do uh, here uh, about the assassination. Uh, and again, he would retreat, however, when his critics pressed him too hard. He said, well, is that the conclusion you come to from my question? Uh, that, not necessarily stating that, but uh, you seem to have uh, concluded that. Uh, among the questions he asked were, why did General Grant not go to the theater uh, with the Lincolns on April 14th? Why did the telegraph lines fail after Lincoln was shot? And how did Booth manage to escape so easily from Washington, D.C.? Actually, the reason that Grant did not go to Ford's Theater was that Mrs. Grant had experienced a rather recent unpleasant encounter uh, with Mrs. Lincoln. Uh, she had been at a place where Lincoln reviewed the troops, and she and a general's wife, uh, and the general's wife rode beside the president, and Mrs. Lincoln was furious. Uh, with that, and she took it out on Mrs. Grant. So you can imagine when Grant said, "By the way, we've been invited to go to uh, to, a, in, to a theater box with the Lincolns tonight." You know, yeah, you go by yourself. You know, I'm not going. So they they made an excuse. They hadn't seen their children in a while. Of course, he's a general in a way. So uh, they they left Washington. That uh, was what they uh, said here. Only the commercial telegraph lines failed too, uh, and we know why. They were shut down by the owner who thought Confederates might be about to seize Washington. So uh, he grounded his own wires because you know, if the Confederates were taken over, he didn't want them to have uh, control of the telegraph wires. The military wires worked fine. There's all kinds of traffic back and forth uh, about Booth and the, the attempt to uh, find Booth and all of that. Uh, and Booth had to boldly talk his way past um, sentries uh, who were manning the Navy uh, bridge as he rode out of Washington. And, uh, Booth was a guy who had a, you, you have to have some uh, pizzazz there to you know, have enough uh, gumption to go and shoot somebody. And uh, he, he gave him his real name. He did, they didn't recognize him, by, or, you know, that he was the actor Booth, but uh, he told him he'd been in the city and uh, he knew you weren't supposed to go out, but he, he told him he was a farmer and he wanted to get home. You know, the war's over, the sentries pretty much say okay. Occasionally, Eisenschimmel admitted there were simple answers to his questions, but he had permanently planted the idea in many readers' minds that the radicals had engineered Lincoln's murder. When asked if he was saying that members of Lincoln's own cabinet were behind his death, Eisenschimmel, as I've just said, often replied that he only asked the questions, uh, leaving the conclusions to be drawn by his readers. Once conspiracy charges are raised, there is no lack of authors who are ready to fill in the blanks. And uh, if we were to talk about all the conspiracy books, we'd be here uh, till tomorrow, you know. There, there's no end of conspiracy books, and they uh, still continue. Uh, but uh, while it's voluminous here, I, I do want to deal uh, at least with one. Uh, it was a book that came out in 1977 uh, along with a movie and very clever marketing technique. Uh, Back in 1977, paperbacks were cheaper. They're not even paperbacks, as we all know, aren't so cheap now, right? But uh, I think the book was $2.95, uh, and they released the movie in conjunction with it. So very clever uh, way of uh, doing this here. And it was based on allegedly newly discovered primary documents, such as missing pages from the Booth Diary. The Lincoln Conspiracy attempts to prove that the case against the radicals uh, is yet tight. Uh, it also raised the often repeated but thoroughly discredited claim uh, that Booth survived Garrett's ban, and that is uh, a common claim, right? Uh, uh, assassins never die, you know, uh, uh, unless they're captured and they do die, uh, but they get away. And uh, th there was a historian. Uh, Lloyd Lewis, who claimed if you look back in antiquity, if somebody assassinated a king, uh, there were rumors that that person that did not die because, you know, it's a horrendous enough crime uh, that you have to spend the rest of your life looking over your shoulder, you know, and wondering, uh, will they catch me? And I, th I think there's something uh, here uh, uh, to that. I, I will say to you, too, uh, don't underestimate the effect of sensational movies uh, and cheaply priced paperbacks, which probably reach a far wider audience than any in 
historian can hope to influence, and I think that is true, uh, right? You know that. Uh, I believe it or not, and we probably don't remember this, but uh, I just know it because I study it. Uh, the Lincoln Conspiracy, I think, was in the top ten grossing films uh, in the year it came out, despite the fact it's dreadful. Uh, and, and the paperback sold hundreds of thousands, right? So uh, they, they laughed all the way to the bank, uh, you know, with, with the critics. It, it didn't bother them too much. Beginning in the 1970s and 80s, however, historians began to expose the dubious nature of much of this previous writing. Uh, bolstered by an appreciation of the modern civil rights movement, the radicals were now seen not as evil men, but rather as advocates of such noble causes as black voting uh, and civil liberties. Several historians now painted the radicals as the last of the mid-19th century reformers, while others demonstrated that Lincoln came from the progressive wing of the Republican Party, thereby undercutting the radicals' alleged motive uh, for his murder. Parenthetically, there have been a number of other dubious conspiracy theories which have been long-lived. One of these is the idea that Lincoln's assassination was a Catholic plot. Since Mary Surratt was a devout Catholic and John Surratt fled to Italy and served in the Papal Guards at Baroli, in fact, that's where he was, uh, they tried to arrest him uh, at Baroli. If you've ever read about John Surratt, uh, he made a dash down uh, over a cliff, got away, and uh, finally was apprehended in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, so he had quite a, a career there with it. Uh, uh, and uh, then arrested and returned to face trial in the United States, many people began to argue that all of the plotters were Catholics and the Catholic Church was behind Lincoln's death. These included a member of the military commission, uh, General Thomas M. Harris, uh, and a former Catholic priest, Father Charles Chinoquie, who actually knew Lincoln, and both of those wrote books. Uh, Thomas Harris, who sat on the military commission, uh, wrote a pretty lengthy book, four or five hundred pages, uh, and it, it's titled Rome's Responsibility for the Death of Lincoln. So uh, you can see what he uh, argued there. Uh, also, there was a historian, uh, Constance Head, unfortunately she died at a fairly young age, but uh, she actually argued, uh, she did a lot of research on Booth, uh, that Booth had converted to Catholicism. I doubt it. Uh, I, I don't think Booth was very uh, religious in the first place, uh, but uh, she believed it. Uh, she used to go to conferences and uh, talk about it. Uh, all of this Catholic plot idea is nonsense, uh, certainly, but I'll tell you what's startling about it is the fact that these anti-Catholic tracts are still in print, and their publishers are apparently still trying to convince Americans in the 21st century that the Catholic Church murdered Lincoln, and then they are. The, the main book, Chinoquy, and there's another, uh, Burke McCarty. Uh, you could go on Amazon uh, today and you could purchase uh, those volumes. So still apparently, unfortunately, some market for that. In the 1880s, academic historians began to, to turn their attention to the assassination. Uh, previously, they had abandoned the field uh, to the sensationalists and the popularizers. And I've experienced that some in my career, uh, occasionally to go to a conference, uh, and some well-known Civil War historian or even Lincoln historian, you know, occasionally say, "Boy, Tom, I, I, w I would never write about the assassination. Uh, there, there's so much crazy stuff there uh, with it. Uh, I'm glad you're doing it, but but not for me. But unfortunately, if academic historians do be in the areas." Pretty soon, you know, this is uh, the sensationalism is uh, honestly what you end up with. Uh, good historian on this, William Hanchett, uh, demolished Eisen Schimmel's conspiracy charges along with several other conspiracy claims in the Lincoln murder conspiracies, while my own book, Beware the People Weeping, argued that the assassination had long been viewed as an isolated event and it could only be properly understood in the context of its own times. Lincoln's death was not a simple murder mystery, but an event that was a climax to a, climax to a bloody civil war. And again, I do think some historians did treat it that way. You know, it, it's a murder mystery. No, it's a murder mystery perhaps at one level, but it, it happened in a certain time frame. Ironically, just as the views of these historians seem to be gaining some consensus, William Tidwell, James Hall, and David Gaddy brought the wheel full circle 
with their allegations that Jefferson Davis and the Confederates actually were responsible for attempts to capture and murder Lincoln. Specifically, they believe that the Kilpatrick Dahlgren raid, and this was a Union raid against uh, Richmond uh, in March of 1864, so getting somewhat toward the end of the war, was set in motion by Lincoln to capture or kill Jefferson Davis. Uh, the raid was unsuccessful, and Dahlgren was killed, but inflammatory papers were allegedly found on his body calling for Davis's murder. And there's some debate about whether those papers were forgeries or whether they're real. Uh, I think most historians believe they were real, uh, though. Uh, although, again, it begs the question, you know, did the orders for this come from Lincoln, or did they come from Stanton, or did some general on down? So some issue with that. While Davis previously turned down plans to kidnap Lincoln, which were legal under the rules of war, on the grounds the president might resist and be injured, and there were people who approached Davis. You know, what about it? I'd get a group together. We could go into Washington. Lincoln's not well guarded. Uh, we perhaps could uh, capture him. But, but Davis, before this, always said, yeah, but he's a big guy. He's not going to just ride off willingly. You know, what if, what if he gets injured or he gets killed? Uh, but the argument here is uh, that the Confederate president now, in retaliation, he saw this, uh, these papers, authorized plans to capture Lincoln, including the plot developed by Booth. Finally, in the spring of 1865, with the Confederacy facing defeat, Torpedo Bureau Officer Captain Thomas Haney was dispatched to blow up Lincoln and his cabinet in a desperate effort to wreak havoc upon the Union governmental structure. When Haney was captured, Booth decided to duplicate the plot as best he could by murdering several high-ranking officials. If the thesis of these historians is valid, then Americans in 1865 had been correct uh, all along uh, about Lincoln's death. And again, uh, you see here, they, they don't argue, at least they didn't in the beginning, that Booth was sent directly uh, by uh, Jefferson Davis of the Confederate government, but he's involved in a lot of this plotting uh, to capture, and so when he sees the plot go awry, you know, then he's trying to duplicate it. That's what they argue. The thesis of come retribution is too complex, again, to discuss here briefly in an afternoon. However, a couple of basic themes emerge. One is a dispute about methodology. Given their own intelligence backgrounds, Tidwell, Hall, and Gaddy, and uh, they all did serve uh, in uh, military intelligence. In fact, uh, Tidwell was a, a, a two-star general, I think. Yeah, I think it was two-star. Uh, claimed they immediately recognized that attempts to capture Lincoln and ultimately assassinate him were the result of in in Confederate intelligence operations although Booth was not sent directly by the Confederate government on April 14, 1865. Rather, Booth, whom the Confederates had backed in a plan to capture the president, was aware of the Haney plot, but when that failed, he duplicated the plot as best he could. Since they were convinced their thesis was absolutely correct, they amassed evidence to support it. To be fair, they admit that their evidence is circumstantial, but they believe it is so overwhelming that it Definite, uh, definitively makes their case. While new methodology and a fresh approach can sometimes yield productive results, some critics pointed out that the historical method is usually deductive uh, rather than inductive. The historian starts with collecting basic evidence, which is then analyzed to determine what conclusions emerge. Otherwise, there is a danger of simply collecting evidence to support a conclusion that you reach before you ever begin any research. The following example illustrates a different approach uh, between Tidwell and his critics. Confederate agent Robert Cox, who had been at home, uh, had a home in St. Catharines, Canada, moved his family to Poughkeepsie, New York, where he had previously lived in October 1864. Since Booth was at the same time in Newburgh, some 14 miles away, the authors conclude there must have been a meeting between the two men. The authors see this as important proof of Booth's contact with Confederate agents, while skeptics argue there is no concrete proof that they met, and if they did, what did they discuss? So you can see it kind of gets a little circumstantial there. Uh, I wouldn't like to uh, make as big a leap as they do based on that. Come retribution also raises major issues 
uh, about the level of violence during the Civil War. Admittedly, there was a time when some authors played up the glor glorious aspects of the Civil War, ignoring just how destructive the conflict was. No responsible historian today would ignore events like the brutality of guerrilla warfare, massacres such as the one at Fort Pillow in Tennessee, uh, surrendering uh, African-American troops were uh, slaughtered there, probably a hundred or more, uh, and uh, some white troops were slaughtered as well, uh, actually, or the mistreatment of prisoners on both sides. Two of our major Civil War historians, both Pulitzer Prize winners, James McPherson and Mark Neely, have long debated whether the Civil War was a modern and total war, with McPherson arguing it was, and Neely viewing it as very much in the tradition of previous wars. It is still not entirely clear that the Civil War reached the level where the highest echelons on both sides were attempting to kill each other's president. In any case, the proponents of the idea that Confederate intelligence had played a leading role in Lincoln's death were at first surprised and then dismayed when their solution to the Lincoln assassination did not achieve the wide consensus that they believe it deserved. And I have to admit, uh, it, it's a while ago, uh, and, and actually, actually, unfortunately, all of the folks I mentioned there are dead, uh, but uh, I was involved in some uh, rather uh, heavy disputes uh, with them uh, when I did say, now I, I did take it as a flattering in one way, it was like, well, if you'd agree with it, this would uh, help tip the balance. So, uh, but uh, they, they were not happy that I, that I didn't see it. So I, I've been at conferences where uh, afterwards, you know, you, you'd sit down, people would say, what did you do to antagonize that guy? You know? <laughs> that didn't seem like a scholarly attack. It seemed like he's, you know, uh, after you for personal reasons. No, it's a scholarly attack. I just don't see the uh, thesis. Uh, in, in, in any case here, uh, since they felt the evidence was so overwhelming, they seemed taken aback uh, that not all scholars were click, uh, quick to accept their conclusions. This is not to say that come re retribution lacks supporters. William Hanch had embraced the author's thesis, as did Ed Steers, in his highly regarded Blood on the Moon, albeit in a slightly more nuanced manner. Following Tidwell, Hall, and Gaddy, Steers argues that Booth had many well-documented dealings with the Confederate Secret Service in Canada, which at a minimum must have been aware of his capture plan and were very likely supporting it. Steers, however, admits that a direct link to the Confederate government in Richmond is much more tenuous and more difficult to prove. In 2004, however, Michael Kaufman's equally acclaimed American Brutus nudged the wheel in a different direction, arguing just as vigorously that Lincoln's murder was a simpler plot. Clever actor Booth openly met with those he tried to induce to join the group, such as his fellow actor Samuel Knapp Chester, so that if those approach failed to sign on, which Chester did, he didn't want any part of it, they would not be able to run to the authorities uh, for fear of implicating themselves. In a similar manner, he believes that Booth openly consorted with Confederate agents in Canada in an attempt to imply Confederate support for what he was doing, whether he really had such backing or not. Using a computer database, Kaufman also argues that most of the conspirators' business was actually conducted in stables where they kept their horses, making Mrs. Surratt's boarding house much less of a focus. Kaufman takes his readers back to a much simpler conspiracy uh, between Booth and his co-conspirators, and the Kilpatrick Dahlgren raid, which is featured so prominently in Come Retribution, does not even appear in his index. Uh, and, and speaking of uh, historians clashing, uh, I, I was uh, a, a, at another conference one time uh, where we had a panel, and uh, Ed Steers and Mike Kaufman and several of us were on it, and the audience knew. The, the Steers and Kaufman don't get along, and they finally agreed on one point. Everybody stood up and gave a, a, a standing ovation uh, <laughs> at this. You know, oh, you guys at least agree on one thing. So, uh, But... Uh, Despite the substantial work of a number of serious scholars, regrettably, the conspiracy theories which plague assassination scholarship have also refused to die. Two fairly recent examples are Dark Union by Ray Neff and Leonard Guttridge and Murdering Mr. Lincoln by Charles Hyam. Neff and Guttridge revived the claims made by the Lincoln conspiracy that Stanton and Lafayette Baker were behind the murder and that Booth escaped to India 
Hyam suggests that Lincoln was involved in cotton speculation, which ultimately caused his death when the speculators no longer required his services. You, know, you can imagine Lincoln, he's making money on cotton speculation <laughs> during the war. You know, he's, de he's dealing with the South behind the scenes, right? Uh, more recently, Bill O'Reilly, in his runaway bestseller, Killing Lincoln, which remained number one on the New York Times bestseller list for well, for well over a year, revived Eisenhimmel's, uh, Eisenhimmel's hint that Stanton might have been involved in the assassination when he asked why the plotters had not thought to eliminate the powerful war secretary. So, you know, they don't attack him. Uh, that makes him part of the plan. He ultimately concluded that Stanton probably was not involved, but like Eisenhimmel, to raise the issue uh, is to plant uh, serious doubt. Uh, O'Reilly's book has been read by millions of Americans, and again, it may well be the only book many people have read uh, about Lincoln's death, and it certainly gives it uh, enormous power and influence. I, I will say, if you look in the uh, bibliography, he cites me uh, as, as one of the historians whose works he looked at. <laughs> Uh, and I'm always a bit leery with, you know, you know, people say, oh, oh Joe O'Reilly got his uh, notions of conspiracy from you, right? He cites your book. So, you know, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's flattering to have your book cited, but some, sometimes it's not always the best thing. Although there is no way to predict where the wheel might turn in the future, it is possible to suggest a couple of areas of inquiry. One of these might be comparative studies of American assassinations. For example, when Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald, many Americans concluded that his action was part of a major conspiracy to eliminate Oswald and prevent him from exposing other plotters, even though Ruby said he killed Oswald because he was extremely upset by Kennedy's death and wanted to spare Jacqueline Kennedy from having to return to Dallas to testify. What is not so well remembered are two attempts to kill Charles Gateau who assassinated James Garfield, including one by a guard who fired into his jail cell. Uh, and uh, fortunately, the bullet hit one of the bars of the jail, uh, and, the, and the guard was placed under arrest. Uh, although, again, there were some people who said, eh, too, bad, too bad he didn't succeed. Uh, and Gateau eventually did end up being executed. Uh, anyway, uh, here. Uh, this seems to indicate that some individuals can be angry enough to kill an assassin without a sinister conspiracy necessarily being involved. Similar comparisons might shed further light on other assassinations, including Lincoln's. Another potential area of investigation might be to examine Lincoln's death in the broader context of other Civil War violence, such as bleeding Kansas, the caning of our own Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, or Reconstruction violence in cities such as New Orleans. Such research could ultimately prove to be more productive than attempting to solve murders that occurred so long ago, they will probably never completely be uh, explained to everyone's satisfaction. In the end, those who seek to understand the Lincoln assassination are still faced with a number of obstacles. Uh, despite the progress that has been made, historians must come to grips with the fact that 150 years after Lincoln's murder, there may be information that can never be recovered. Every successful presidential assassin was either killed or tried relatively quickly uh, and executed. Only Booth and Oswald know the full extent of their plans, and one of the reasons they are surrounded by conspiracy theories is that they did not live to tell their version of what happened. If there are still any secrets about John Wilkes Booth, they probably went to the grave with him when he was shot and killed by Boston Corbett. In 2015, uh, we paused to commemorate uh, the sesquicentennial, as uh, was mentioned. I, uh, I was the vice chair of the Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission of Massachusetts from 2011 to 2015. Very inter interesting experience. We planned a lot of things, and, and we did quite a few things. We had no budget, but, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the society here knows what, what we talk about. But uh, I, I think we still managed to do quite a few things, and... Uh, in 2015, would have, would have marked the 150th anniversary. Uh, but it's difficult at this point in time uh, to decide, should we be optimistic or pessimistic about the state of assassination studies and the direction they may take in the future? 
if there is validity in viewing assassination scholarship as a wheel, then it seems logical to assume that the wheel will continue to turn, as it has done for the past 150 years. However, one must remember that wheels are neutral. They make no moral judgments about where they land. If the past is prologue, new research may move investigators closer to a more correct understanding of Lincoln's assassination, but unfortunately there is no guarantee that the wheel won't just as easily return to conspiracy theories which have long since been discredited. Thank you. And I would be glad to take questions. I did say, I, I, I'm not plugging this uh, for monetary purposes. I don't get any royalties on this at all. <laughs> but if you're interested in reading my article, it's in the, uh, the Riddle of the Lincoln Assassination. Uh, there are 14 other uh, Lincoln Assassination scholars, and uh, it was edited by Frank Williams, the uh, uh, ex-Chief Justice uh, uh, Emeritus of Rhode Island, a longtime friend who I know back to my undergrad days at BU, and Mike Burkheimer, who uh, worked with me as a book editor on the uh, Lincoln Herald. So uh, that, that's where that comes from. And uh, this was supposed to come out in 2015 to coincide with uh, the 150th. It, it came out in 2016, so the, the press missed it by a year. You know? <laughs> that's, uh, that is the... Uh, yeah. Um, and I'm going to repeat the questions because they did put a mic on me, if you notice. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm told by Dana, who, who did a talk, uh, that uh, your question won't pick up. They're, they're, do, they're filming this. So what do I personally think happened? Uh, I personally think uh, John Wilkes Booth is a very rabid uh, Southern supporter. Uh, he thinks that Abraham Lincoln uh, has done away with slavery. The Booths were slave owners. Uh, you can find in Booth's writings uh, where he says slavery is the best system for the black man and you know, all this kind of thing. And I think in the beginning it was a capture plan. Uh, he got together some people he had known, uh, some when he was younger uh, and all of that. So he assembles this team uh, and uh, they did make one attempt uh, at uh, capturing Lincoln uh, on uh, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, uh, 1864, uh, they rode out. Uh, Lincoln had gone out to the soldiers' home, uh, or the Campbell Hospital, but out in the soldiers' home area. And uh, they waited by the roadside, uh, or they went into a restaurant. Booth went over to check, is he here? And they found out Lincoln didn't come. Uh, he had changed his plans. Uh, so they disbanded uh, with that. And, and, and some of them, again, were only committed to capture. Uh, if you'd have said to old Laughlin and Arnold, we're going to kill Lincoln, they'd have been out the door. But I think at the end of the war, Booth decided uh, if I could kill Lincoln and Seward and perhaps some others or whatever, but at least those two, that would sort of decapitate the Union government and it might give the Confederacy some room to uh, revive a bit uh, or push on here. So uh, I think that's about, in, in my view, what you can prove with it. Uh, but, you know, again, if you read this voluminous literature, and I, I've touched on some today, but uh, you'll, you'll see all these other conspiracy theories, and we get somebody come up here and talk about this is a Catholic plot, or, you know, yeah, I still believe the radical Republicans, and that stuff's out there. In fact, Mike Mayoni, who unfortunately died at a fairly young age, but uh, he was the, uh, the head of the uh, Ford's Theater uh, and the historian there. And he used to lament that there wasn't a week went by that somebody didn't come into Ford's Theater and say, gee, isn't it a shame that Lincoln's own cabinet did him in? Uh, Mike could tear his hair out. He didn't have much hair to tear either, but <laughs> maybe that's what had happened. Uh, yep. Yeah. Very little uh, in this period. And one interesting fact, uh, there had been an assassination attempt 
uh, against Andrew Jackson way back in 1835. Uh, that assassin was clearly insane. Uh, he thought he was the King of England and a few things like that. Uh, his pistols didn't fire, uh, so no harm. You would have thought, though, that people would have said, gee, pretty easy to get in to see the president. And in fact, this assassin, Richard Lawrence, he visited Jackson in his office. He walked into the White House. Uh, he sat down, and he told Jay, he didn't say he was the King of England, I think, on that visit, but he did say to him, you're running my American lands over here, and you owe me money. I want money. Jackson probably scratched his head on that. What, what, what's, what's, what's this guy talking about, right? I would have thought with that they might have taken a little bit more precaution. Now you get a civil war. Uh, is there any more security for Lincoln? Uh, not really. People can walk up the driveway of the White House, walk in, uh, see the president. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not great. However, eventually, they, they did have uh, a, uh, uh, some uh, security. Uh, there were a few policemen uh, from the Washington force uh, that were uh, designated uh, to protect the president. And one of those was there uh, at the theater. And it's always been wondered what happened to him. Uh, well, where did he go? I, I think some people feel Lincoln was a bit of a fatalist. Most presidents are, right? You, you won't find a president uh, that's going to say, I, I, I must travel in you know, bulletproof vehicles, or well, they do in a uh, limo, I suppose. Uh, but uh, many people think he had, he had merely said, John Packer, you, John, uh, you, you know, I don't need your protection here. Why don't you go down and have a drink if you want, or go down and watch the play, sit down there. So when Booth comes up to the box, there was, in fact, uh, an, an individual seated there, not Packer, who was a guard. Packer would have carried a weapon. Uh, Booth shows him a card. We don't know what it was, was on it, uh, but, uh, you know, the person who's sitting there says, go ahead. So he walked boldly uh, right into the box uh, and then, you know, strangely managed to get away, right? He apparently broke his leg when he fell, although some people will argue that didn't happen right at Ford's Theater either, that his horse fell on him later. I think it, I think it did happen uh, at Ford's Theater. But it is astounding that in the midst of a civil war that kills 750,000 people, Washington, D.C., uh, right across the border uh, from Virginia, uh, also surrounded by Maryland, which stayed in the Union, but only through some coercion, uh, that uh, uh, there wasn't better security. He, he did at times have a, a, a cavalry force assigned, too, uh, that would ride along behind his carriage uh, when he went out. Uh, and uh, Walt Whitman uh, was in Washington uh, at the time. And, and he and Lincoln got, if you believe Whitman, I think I do, got kind of a nodding acquaintance, you know. Uh, he'd see, Whitman would see the carriage going by, the, you know, the president would nod, Walt Whitman would nod, and Whitman mentions, you know, cavalry running behind. Lincoln didn't like the cavalry. They're noisy, right? You got horses, you got swords, you got pistols, uh, and all that. Uh, he couldn't talk to Mary, you know, she usually went with him. Uh, so he tried to uh, get rid of that. So long response, but uh, really, no great security. And truth to tell, was there any security uh, with Garfield? Uh, no, there wasn't, uh, right? Uh, uh, he doesn't have any more security. Uh, and McKinley had a little bit more, but almost too much. There was something like 40 people, including some artillerymen. I don't know what good artillerymen do as guards of an individual. Uh, and uh, Sholgosh was in line, the assassin walks right up, shakes hands uh, with the person, and then shoots McKinley. So, I, I don't know, I, I can't explain it entirely, uh, except some, something of the idea that maybe in a republic, in a democracy, these things don't happen. They happen very rarely, and, and it's crazy people when it does happen. You know, but, you know, four, four presidents were dead in the, that time frame. Yeah. I've also looked at Booth himself right. and his family. Yeah. And his brother Edwin was uh, his older brother, 
and he and his brother really uh, told, he told John, said, you take the south. I don't want to see you in my territory yep. in the north. And he had his own uh, theater company in New York, his own mansion, and was quite well endowed. Right. And both of them really didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And John hated his brother. Yeah, he, d he did, absolutely. And Lincoln knew Edwin. Yes, he did. He knew him, and I think he played at Ford Theater, and Lincoln had, had met him and everything else. And some people think that there was a lot of motivation in John Wilkes Booth's mind. I'm going to get my brother, and I'm going to be center stage, and I'm going to outdo him, which he could never do on stage. Yeah, that's been argued, certainly. There was kind of sibling uh, rivalry. And, and that John wasn't quite the actor uh, that Edwin was. Uh, if, if, if you want a, a good Booth biography, and it's a recent one, it's uh, Terry Alford, Fortune's Fool. Uh, and uh, there hasn't been a long... Yeah, Doris Kearns has written about it, but not an entire book. Uh, there have been some books with it, but the first really modern study uh, of Booth, and he argues that to a degree uh, with it. And interestingly, when you say... Uh, Edwin Booth, Edwin Booth, and this sounds like an apocryphal story, but it's true, uh, saved Robert Todd Lincoln, Lincoln's son. Uh, Lincoln's son was standing on a railroad platform, and, you know, there's the gap there with it, and the train was about to start up, and Robert Todd was about to fall into that, you know, either be badly injured or uh, killed, and Edwin Booth happened to be there uh, and reached out his hand uh, and grabbed him. So think of the irony of that. You know, Edwin Booth saves the son, and his brother uh, then uh, kills uh, Lincoln. I, I will say with Terry Offord one thing, too, with Booth. He rather definitively, he agrees uh, with me, uh, there's no evidence that Booth worked uh, for the Confederate, uh, you know, uh, Secret Service in the assassination. He just doesn't find that. Uh, he doesn't believe that at all. But he did find one other interesting thing, though, too. Uh, John Wilkes Booth was present at the hanging of John Brown, right? Uh, he was in Richmond, uh, and uh, there was fear on the part of Southerners. People are going to try and break John Brown out, you know, before he hangs. So Booth talked his way into a Confederate unit there that was getting on a train, and up they went uh, to uh, West Virginia, and he was there for the hanging. And what Terry Alford found out that I, I amazing that we didn't know this before, used to be thought, oh, yeah, he went kind of on a lack and whatever. There's actually in the Confederate archives, uh, not the Confederate archives, but Southern archives in Richmond, uh, a piece of paper showing that Booth actually enlisted in the unit. I mean, he wasn't in for a long period of time. It's a militia unit. Uh, he got paid money. Uh, for doing that, and he apparently met John Brown. He, he was guarding the, the jail outside, and he went in. Now, we don't know what, what that encounter was like. It might have been nothing. He might have looked, there's John Brown, and out he went. But you wonder, you know, would Booth have gone up? And interestingly enough, Booth admired John Brown. And can you see why he might have? No, yeah, <laughs> good answer, right? Yeah, the reason he did admire him, uh, here's a guy who takes violent action for his cause. And Booth didn't like that cause. He's glad to see Brown executed. But he says, old Brown died nobly, you know, and you could tell he admires that, a guy who, you know, is going to take action or even commit violence uh, for uh, the, the, the cause. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know, other questions? Anybody have? I have a question yeah. to um, people in the balcony. Did anybody see him before he pulled the trigger? Because I did yeah. conflicting reports on that. Yeah, they did. Uh, the question was, did people in the balcony uh, see uh, Booth before he pulled the trigger? Uh, he got up to the balcony. Uh, he moved along uh, behind there in the balcony uh, over toward the door. But truth to tell, did anybody think anything of that? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, he's a well-known actor, uh, and again, maybe not quite as well-known as Edwin or quite as good an actor, although Terry Alford argues maybe a better actor than he sometimes gets credit for with it. But it, it would be like today. 
uh, if you were sitting in a theater, and it can't happen today because the president's got security, but if, if Johnny Depp, you know, uh, came up ar around the back, and people, oh, there's Johnny Depp, you wouldn't assume Johnny Depp was out to shoot the president, right? Now, he's not going to get in to see the president now. Uh, so, yeah, many people saw him. The, the balcony is fairly uh, expansive there, uh, but uh, nobody thought a thing of it uh, until he fired and then jumped to the stage. And then they knew pretty quickly it was him. People in the audience did. You know, it's Booth. He, he's recognizable. He's, he's a matinee idol. He, he's played a lot of parts. And he played here in Massachusetts, too. He is a Southern actor, but he liked Boston. He, he actually owned property out on Commonwealth Avenue. Uh, that's a, uh, another thing. He speculated in land there, yeah. Hmm. Um, a direct descendant of uh, Dr. Samuel Mudd actually lives in Easton, and he's also a doctor. Oh, really? Yeah, and... Um, Gr great grandson? Uh, I think he's, the, you know, I can find out, but I think he's the, the, the great, great, great nephew or something. Oh, okay, nephew, yeah, yeah. all right. Um, his name is Dr. Mudd. He's also a doctor. And, um, and he's done a little bit of a study. He would like to have been here today, but he had, he had other things he had to do. I, I would have liked to have met him. <laughs> and that could be arranged, if you'd like. Yeah. But um, I, I was just curious as to what you... I, I know that Dr. Samuel Mudd was an interesting character in himself, and he also... Uh, his involvement in the plot, or so-called, you know, in the event, is sort of controversial. And I was just kind of wondering, once again, you know, what your personal opinion is on what his relationship to the assassination was. Uh, let me also just say a word as you raise this, too, because the, the Mudd family uh, lived a long time, particularly the grandkids. Uh, and uh, there, there was, uh, and his first name eludes me, but Mudd, uh, the, the uh, grandson of uh, Dr. Mudd, uh, and I, I've met him. He's dead now, but uh, and he, he had a sister. Uh, he, he lived almost 100. I think he was 100. Uh, he had a sister, Mary. Uh, she lived to 95, and they spent a lot of time trying to clear the name. It, it really goes to the question uh, you're asking here with it. And they were successful. Uh, and he was a doctor, too. That seemed to run in the family. Uh, the, the grandson, Dr. Mudd, uh, he got Jimmy Carter to write a letter uh, which says, uh, in effect, I, I can't do this officially. <laughs> Too much time has gone by. Uh, you know, there's no way I can do it through official channels. But I do agree with you that, in fact, uh, your grandfather uh, was probably innocent. And I, and I have a copy of that. He, he sent me a copy, uh, Dr. Mudd. I'm, going to give it to Orson here at some point uh, for the, for the uh, Bridgewater for archives. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the old view of Dr. Mudd before books like uh, Ed Steers uh, was uh, this guy uh, is, in fact, uh, uh, innocent. Uh, he, uh, uh, Booth, uh, uh, you know, wore a disguise, false whiskers. Uh, they didn't even realize it was him. He came in the middle of the night. Uh, they weren't suspicious of him at all. I'm a doctor. I get somebody that's got a broken leg. Uh, what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to fix it. But the more recent <laughs> evidence uh, is uh, we always knew Booth was down there a couple of times. I mean, he went down. One time, supposedly, buying a horse. Stayed overnight at Mud's house. That would kind of make you wonder, why doesn't he recognize him? Uh, but there was at least one other time that Booth was down there, uh, that he and his wife uh, hid from the authorities. And it's pretty clear Mudd was doing some underground work for the Confederates, uh, maybe passing letters and uh, those types of things. I mean, hey, it's in a war. People are doing that. But again, when you do that type of thing, it's sort of espionage. You know, you get into uh, trouble with it. So I would be much more inclined to take the view uh, they probably knew who he was. They may not have known what he did. I don't think Mudd, Mudd didn't know there was going to be assassination uh, at all. Uh, and then when they found out, they were horrified. Oh, geez, he was here. Uh, we better say we didn't know him, whatever. You know, you get caught in kind of a web of 
uh, lies there with it, uh, and uh, uh, all of that. So he was pardoned after four years, right? Uh, he and uh, Arnold and uh, Spangler, O'Laughlin, died in prison. They, they were down in the Caribbean there. Some people try to argue, well, he spent four years. Maybe that's about what his involvement was. You know, there was no proof he was involved uh, in the murder uh, with it. But I, th I think that's where that stands now. And, and I, I'd be interested. I mean, do you, do you know uh, this mud? Is he sp still to be thinking of clearing his ancestors' uh, name? Or? Uh, you'd have to talk to him exactly where he is. And like I said, yeah. you know, I, could, I could give you his contact information. Yeah. Uh, I, I, think, I think that he thinks his ancestor was... Yes. Yeah, and it wouldn't be surprising, but again, naturally, in the family, we, we, we'd all think that way. If it was my, if it was my great, great, great uh, uh, you know, either grandfather or, or relative, at least I was a nephew, uh, you'd probably be doing that uh, with it. But, uh, yeah, he's been controversial. And, again, Mrs. Surratt, most of the literature you read on Mrs. Surratt uh, says she was innocent. She ran a boarding house. Her son got in bad company. You know, he got in with Booth and these other people. And... Uh, how, how, how is she going to know? At some level, uh, with those of us who have kids say, yeah, I don't know everything my kids do. <laughs> Fortunately, you don't do anything bad. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, here. Uh, but as I say, read, read Kate Lassen's The Assassin's Accomplice. Uh, uh, and Kate Lassen uh, thinks uh, she was deeply involved with Booth and, and probably maybe even deserved being executed. You know, she knew about the plot and all of that. So, yeah. But it's interesting, you can still trace it through ants, uh, you know, uh, through the family. Yeah. So, all in all, in your opinion, did the military trial get it basically right to hang those in? Because four people got hung. Yeah, I think they did, yeah. In fact, in, in the book I, I did, the major book on this, uh, that's what I argue. Uh, the, the people who were executed, and I talked a little bit about it in the talk here, they were obviously guilty. Uh, Powell attacks Seward. Uh, Herald's found with Booth and Garrett's band. You know, uh, Atzerodt says, yeah, he asked me to kill the vice president, but I, I lost my nerve. I didn't do it. Uh, that's not going to get you anywhere. But the others were much more clearly involved in the kidnapping, right? So uh, Arnold, uh, O'Laughlin, uh, and, uh, well, Mudd, again, a little bit different situation. And then again, Spangler is interesting uh, because that's basically all he did. Booth rode up to the door and said, hold my horse, Ned. <laughs> Ned used to hold his horse, <laughs> you know, if Booth rode up to the door and get paid for it. But, but he, had this, the, the, he was a scene shifter, right? So the scenes had to be shifted. I, I can't do it. You've got to you know, get this scene. Uh, so there was a... Uh, a young guy who worked around the theater, Peanuts John, Peanut John Burroughs, handed him the horse. But after the assassination, uh, some people said, yeah, we, we heard Booth ask uh, Spangler here uh, to hold his horse. And, and he was only sentenced to six years, accessory after the fact. Yeah, he didn't get life uh, imprisonment. And again, uh, O'Laughlin dies. He gets yellow fever. Uh, and uh, Mudd and Arnold... Uh, their parole, right, uh, by uh, Johnson. Uh, so uh, in four years later, and interestingly with Spangler, uh, around 1900, he saw a rumor in the paper that he had died. Uh, Spangler, he was, uh, you know, one of the assassins, uh, later says dead. Uh, he got angry and he wrote a book. Uh, so so you, you could read Spangler's account of what happens. And, and in his account, very clearly, I was I was in the kidnapping plan. Uh, any southern boy would have done that. And if you think about it, uh, here uh, any northern boy might have gone into a plot to kidnap Jefferson Davis. You know, but it's when you get to murder that it uh, gets a little bit different. There, yeah, definitely. Other uh, points everybody has. I'm going to make two shameless plugs. One for the old Colony Historical uh, Society. When do you meet Dana? When's your meeting? Okay, third Thursday, if you're interested, uh, uh, not just in Lincoln, but Civil War. We have the East Bridgewater Civil War Roundtable. That meets on the second uh, Tuesday uh, at the library. We meet at 730, so uh, 
Uh, I, did, I did tell Dana I'd get, I'd get in the old colony too. So, uh, But uh, thank you again for coming, and uh, we continue, uh, I'm sure, to read more books coming out and articles on the assassination. Never ends. <laughs>